Before we can calculate the forces on the SFRS, we need one more building block. And that is, what are the wall forces due to a moment applied at the center of rigidity? So what I've shown here is a general building plan. I've defined an x-axis and a y-axis. I'm applying a moment here at the center of rigidity. And I'm assuming just for the sake of argument that there's four walls at the perimeters or four lateral resisting elements at the perimeters. And you'll notice that the moment is applied counterclockwise and these four forces resist the moment in a clockwise direction. And so the basic question here is what is the magnitude of these forces and what is the direction? Well, the physical direction is given here. I'd like to also present an equation that can help you determine the direction directly from the algebra. Let's start working through that. The basic concept at play here is that moments are resisted proportionally to torsional rigidity, Rd squared. Given the moment at the center of rigidity, the moment in any given lateral component is equal to that component's torsional rigidity divided by the total torsional rigidity. Now what we're actually interested in is the force in each component. So we'll divide this equation by d. We get this expression right here that tells us what the force is in each wall as a function of the moment at the center of mass and the wall's rigidity and the rigidity of the various walls. Now so far we've been dealing in absolute value. If you wanted the actual direction of the forces you need to think physically like I did at the beginning of this slide. But it is possible to come up with an algebraic expression where the direction of the force comes out naturally and that's what we'll do right now. Looking once more at the forces and moment on the diagram shown, we'll notice that the counterclockwise moment is resisted by a positive force in the x direction times a positive distance in the y direction. It's also resisted by a force in the negative y direction times a positive distance in the x direction. You'll notice there's a little flipping of the signs here, and we can capture this in the following expression. This term s means the sign of the equation. This term is positive for a force in the x direction, and for a force in the y direction, it's negative. Let's look at one example for how this equation works out. We'll consider this force right here. The moment at the center of rigidity is positive because it's counterclockwise. The rigidity is always positive. The distance acts from the origin in the positive x direction. The denominator is positive because it has to do with rigidity and distance squared. And the sign, if we look at the expression here, is negative. All of this results in a negative force. That's consistent with what's drawn because the force is drawn downward or in the negative y direction. The expression given here captures both the magnitude as well as the sign of the force in the SFRS. Next, we'll look at another building block that we need. That is, what is the actual moment at the center of rigidity for a given load and eccentricity? I've shown story shears in the x and y direction, as well as eccentricities in the x and y direction. And these are all indicated positive. So forces acting in their respective positive directions, eccentricities in their respective positive directions. For loading in the x direction, that's this force right here. So this is the applied story shear. If the applied story shear is in the positive x direction multiplied by an eccentricity in the positive y direction, this will result in a moment that acts clockwise, hence that negative sign right there. For loading in the y direction, a positive force in the y direction acting over a positive eccentricity in the x direction causes a counterclockwise or positive moment, which is why there is a positive sign in this expression. For general loading, we can use the same term s as before. This is a positive number for a story shear in the x direction. It's a negative number for a story shear in the y direction. This is the resulting expression. Let's do just one example evaluating this expression. We'll consider shear acting in the y direction. So that would be this force acting over this moment arm. So if you look at the signs, there's the negative sign of the equation. The force is acting in the y direction, so the sign is negative. The shear is acting upward, that's the positive y direction, and the eccentricity is rightward, that's the positive x direction. 
So two negatives give us a resulting positive sign. Positive is counterclockwise, which is consistent with what's drawn there. We have two expressions. One, the one that we just saw, gives us the magnitude and direction of the moment at the center of rigidity, given a story shear. And the one that we saw previously gives us the magnitude and direction of the forces in the SFRS components, given a moment at the center of rigidity. Next, we'll apply this concept to the actual example that we're working on. Here then is the diaphragm that we are considering. We have a moment at the center of rigidity, and this moment has to be resisted by the forces that I show here. You'll notice that the moment is acting in the counterclockwise direction, and about the center of rigidity, all of the forces that I've shown act in the clockwise direction. So each of the components of the SFRS in both directions will resist the applied moment at the center of rigidity. This is the expression that we already derived above. The force in each SFRS component, this is that sine factor, the moment at the center of rigidity that for now we'll just assume is known, and then the rigidity and the perpendicular distance from the center of mass of all of the different walls. So each wall has a certain distance. Again, this is the perpendicular distance from the center of rigidity to the wall. For instance, wall A has a distance in the negative x direction, and that distance is 37.5. Another one might be walls 2 have distances in the positive y direction equal to 12.42. So you can see both the magnitude and the direction of d and how that's measured. The rigidities in this column we talked about previously. We calculate r times d. We calculate r times d squared. We sum r times d squared. We have a column here for the sine. And this sine is negative for a force in the y direction. And it's positive for a force in the x direction. So walls a, b, c, and d act in the y direction, carry a negative sign. Walls 1 and 2 act in the x direction, carry a positive sign. Calculate f by the equation above. Divide it by the moment to get a relative idea, and then multiply it by 100 because the numbers are so small that this will allow us to see the numbers better. I've shown the magnitudes in the correct locations on the diagram. We can also look at the directions. So we'll start with walls A and B. A and B act in the y direction. In this diagram, the positive y direction is to the right. C and D act in the y direction. In this diagram, the negative y direction is to the left. Wall 1 acts in the x direction. Negative x in this diagram is upward. Walls 2ab and 2cd act in the positive x direction. In this diagram, that's downward. Once again, these directions are consistent with what was drawn, and we argued physically as to why that had to be the case. If these equations aren't helpful to you, don't use them. You can always think physically about the problem. As a matter of fact, we should always think of physically about the problem anyway but it could help save you some time to also have the algebraic indication about the direction in which the wall forces go.